Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. This is Save the Great South Bay's Bay Friendly Yard Series, a monthly uh, webinar series on how you can make your bay, your yard bay friendly. Today's topic is the three essential elements of a bay friendly yard. Next slide. This program today is presented in collaboration with the Village of Amityville, Amityville Public Library, Lindenhurst Memorial Library, Babylon Public Library, the Friends of Connect River, and the Nathaniel Conklin House in Babylon Village. We thank all of our collaborating presenters. A little bit about our organization. Save the Great South Bay was founded in 2013 by two Sable High School alumni who had returned from their, uh, to their high school reunion and were appalled at the state of the Great South Bay. There and then they decided that uh, they were going to do something about it and thus our organization was formed. We are now made up of a board of nine people, plus myself, Robin Sylvester, the executive director, and we actively work to promote programs and policies that protect and preserve the Great South Bay. Next slide. Our three main programs include the Creek Defender Program, whereby we work together with municipalities, local organizations, schools, elected officials, and others who help patrol, identify areas in need, and clean up along the 50 creeks and rivers leading into the Great South Bay. We also work on shellfish restoration, including the Great South Bay Oyster Project, which will restore oyster habitat to the Great South Bay, promoting local aquaculture and a natural filtration system that will help keep the bay clean. Our goal is to plant 100 million oysters over the next five years. And finally, what we're here for today is our habitat restoration, by which we promote native habitat restoration through the planting of native species, stormwater management, and the utilization of eco-friendly maintenance techniques with the end goal of improving the quality of water that enters the bay. Next slide. So to introduce today's speaker, I'd like to um, welcome Frank Piccinini. Frank is a biologist, a staunch environmentalist, and is chairperson of our native planting restoration program, our in-house plant expert. We like to refer to Frank as our plant nerd. His role includes researching, designing, and implementing swamp forests and other native plantings along the south shore of Long Island, which served as filters to creek pollutants. Frank is also a senior attorney at Sterling Risk and co-founder of Simple Consulting, as well as the general counsel at The Root Cause. Next slide. Th thanks so much for having me, Robin. I really welcome, appreciate welcome, the opportunity. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So, so today's, uh, today's presentation, as Robin suggested, is how to make your yard bay friendly, the three essential elements of bay friendly yards. So what is a Bay Friendly Yard? So our Bay Friendly Yard program, we put together with the thought that committed actions on the scale of an individual yard in the aggregate can make a big difference. So today we want to talk to you about how and why you, what you can do in your yard to really save the Great South Bay. So let's go back in time, nature untouched prior to 1900. It was largely untouched, dotted with farms. The Pine Barrens extended almost way out to almost to Nassau County. Uh, there was a large tract of land called the Hempstead Plains, which was, you know, rolling, uh, rolling plains of native plants as far as the eye could see. And once there was a con almost contiguous chain of Atlantic white cedar forest spreading from Brooklyn to Montauk, it was a beautiful landscape that supported a wide variety of wildlife and abundant shellfish uh, populating the Great South Bay, along with other other natural resources here. So it was a beautiful land, still is beautiful. But we changed it a lot. So in the in the 20s to the 40s, uh, Levittown and all the surrounding landscape was developed, and and this is really where I think there and a lot of folks point to as where the urban yard uh, sort of originated. It's the epicenter of this traditional, you know, one tree, mass-produced homes and a carpet of cement-like lawn. It's just it's really where it all started. Uh, it was a planned community, about 17,000 homes for returning GIs, and uh, each each home came with two trees and a cesspool. Uh, you know, this is the precursor to uh, a lot of the issues that we unfortunately are facing today. And then the development continued. Industrial, uh, lots of strip malls, unplanned growth, really. It's just, Long Island is is the quintessential sprawl type thing. You know, we had the New York metropolitan area, and then we just sprawled and sprawled and sprawled and sprawled. And we, we grew uh, we grew out. We didn't really grow up or smartly, truthfully. Um, so you have to drive everywhere to get anywhere on Long Island. And it's just, it's 
you know, it's it's tough. And unfortunately, all of this development, while you know, arguably increasing the quality of life, has had a deleterious impact on the health and ecological function of the Great South Bay and all the all of Long Island's environment, really. So thousands of acres of natural habitat, pine barrens, Hempstead Plains, all these, you know, Atlantic white cedar forests are now just patches of turf lawn. These are ecologically lifeless. They're they're monocultures that are simply just for the for the most part, it's just concrete uh, from a stormwater st standpoint, especially on a cold winter day like today, the water will run right off. And what's worse on top of that is not only will uh, the natural assimilation of nitrogen to, into vegetation be reduced given a lawn, we artificially add nitrogen to these lawns um, and that just runs right off. Uh, we also introduce lots of invasive species. A lot of folks like their pretty wisteria and English ivy because it looks charming and you know English cottage look. Uh, but unfortunately, these species if, don't stay put on your landscape. They just go into different portions of tracts of land and forests and just invade and destroy, unfortunately. Um, so the suburban dream, in my opinion, is really more of a suburban nightmare from an ecological standpoint. And this part really bugs us. You know, it's the cornerstone, the foundation of our food web are the insects. It's, it's really the basic basis of life, the, the first trophic level from plants up to higher level organisms. And a good example are caterpillars. Um, a lot of caterpillars are very specific to host plants. And without these fat, you know, sacks of protein that provide food for the birds, so, you know, we don't have a lot of birds. Um, so, so that's just one example of the trophic chain that's disrupted by the fact that we have just non-native ornamental and sometimes invasive plants in our yards. It just does not support the biodiversity that's supported by our native plants. And unfortunately, we can't live without the bugs. Uh, we, you know, it's, it's really the basis of all of our life is are these bugs. And by not supporting them on our landscapes, we're not supporting the basis of our life. So that's the, the bad news, that's, that's the gloomy stuff, but there's a lot of hope here. Uh, we're very hopeful that, again, small actions taken on the scale of your individual yard in the aggregate will make a great, will help a great deal. Um, so we started the Bay Friendly Yards program and there's three essential elements to the Bay Friendly Yards. One is habitat restoration, the other is stormwater management, and the third is local stewardship, which is our way of saying maintenance, stewardship. We, we prefer to steward the land rather than maintain the land. And I'll go through each of these elements for you. So habitat restoration, why? Um, so these plants have co-evolved in the landscape that we, we all live amongst, right? So native plants provide food for the local pollinators, which again, supports the insects, which will in turn provide food for birds and other wildlife. Um, the plants actually, you know, as compared to things like lawn or some of these fast growing invasive species, the root systems are much more complex. Uh, they develop, they increase what's called soil porosity or decreasing the soil bulk density. Basically, and these native plants make this, the soil more spongy. So stormwater stays put. And these plants also will assimilate nitrogen and encourage denitrification. So uh, instead of it running off into our rivers and ultimately into the bay, causing all these brown tides and other eutrophication issues, um, it stays put right in your backyard. <laughs> so how do we do it? Well, uh, the first and biggest thing, in our opinion, that you can do on your land is addition by subtraction. Remove the invasive species. Uh, invasive species are, are really wreaking havoc across the country. Um, but let's not worry about private uh, public land. We'll get to that. First, let's just start with the invasive species that often go unnoticed and exist within your your, your yard. As you can see uh, on the this picture on the right is an oak tree that was just strangled by a oriental bittersweet plant, which is invasive. Um, those are almost ligature marks on on this plant, and you know we cut the the vine, and uh, it was. It, it was like the oak tree was thanking us. It had a new lease on life. Uh, you can see pictured here is uh, English ivy. And unfortunately, all these big box stores are still selling this stuff. And it 
completely decimates the uh, the health of the surrounding forest. If you drive up and down uh, the Meadowbrook or the Wadsworth Parkway or you know east and west on the southern state, just look look at all the trees that are completely smothered by the stuff. And, and that's just you know those are just the plants on the side of the parkway. The stuff is everywhere. So the biggest thing you can do to restore habitat, in our opinion, is just to remove the invasive species and you know addition by subtraction. Then when you're done with that, you could replace the ornamental plants. Um, so you know Japanese maple, Norway maple, Russian olive. You know all these things are they sound foreign because they're not from here. Uh, actually, those are all uh, can, all those plants we list there are invasive. They're not actually just ornamentals. Uh, ornamentals are non-natives that you know don't tend to go into other forested landscapes and invade. Um, they might as well be statues. Uh, and, and the funny thing is there's equally stunning native alternatives. Why are we using these lifeless statues when we can put in these beautiful native plants that are just as beautiful or in a lot of cases more beautiful, uh, which will not just bloom these beautiful flowers, but you'll have blooms in the form of beautiful but butterflies visiting these plants. You know, so replace the ornamentals where you can. Here's some examples of plant this, not that. I, I joined a lot of the Long Island Native Plant Gardening Group and the Long Island Gardening Group on Facebook. Uh, and you know, every fall without fail, you see everybody taking pictures of their burning bush saying, oh, it's so beautiful. It's really a nondescript, somewhat ugly plant in the during the summer but in the fall yeah admittedly the, the leaves turn a nice red the problem with burning bush is again it does not stay put the birds eat the berries fly off and poop in the woods um, so instead of planting this nondescript most of the year bush that completely destroys the ecological structure and function of surrounding lands plant something beautiful a uh, red chokeberry is a good example it has similarly beautiful leaves in the, in the fall and it feeds our birds, uh, some very high protein and high fat content berries and it's not gonna destroy neighboring forests. Similarly, fountain grass is an invasive species. We see it incorporated into all these landscapes. Uh, instead, plant a little blue stem or big blue stem. Either way, there's a lot of native grasses that, you know, why are we planting these things from other countries that serve no function here? Plant something that's native and functional and equally that's beautiful. You know, Cal Calgary pear, I think there's a typo there, uh, but Calgary pear, it's, it's, it's an incredible one because it's just, it's, the municipalities gave these out to people. They, they really like, uh, folks like the beautiful blooms in the spring and admittedly they're beautiful, but again, they don't stay put. In the spring, when you're driving along and you see all these beautiful white flowers in the, amongst our native forests, unfortunately, those are probably Calgary pears that escapes cultivation. Instead, planted dogwood, flowering dogwood, for example, Cornus Florida, is a beautiful and native replacement for Calgary pear. You know, similarly, foxglove is invasive. Plant milkweed instead, and you'll get monarch butterflies coming to your plants. You know, and, and then plant natives. You know, they're beautiful and they support a large number of local species and attract things like pollinators. Um, and how do you do that? Well, I mean, if you want to attach attract pollinators, but counterintuitively plant trees. If you look at the National Wildlife Federation website, uh, the plants that are serve as the greatest host plants for the vast majority of plants are the, our oaks, beeches, and maples. And if you want to plant some flowers, please do. Uh, milkweed, goldenrods, and asters. Those are very highly productive plants that are re rather versatile. Um, you know, so it's, you don't really have to be an expert to plant these things. Really, these things are very well adapted to Long Island's climate and Long Island soils. So find something native and it'll likely flourish in your yard with little effort. So habitat restoration, another tip that I have is to reduce the size of your lawn. This is my backyard actually pictured here. And every year we bite a little bit more lawn off at the margins. My rule of thumb is that if you have to, if the only time you walk on that tract of land in your yard is to mow it, well then, gosh, it does not need to be lawn. Make it productive, make it beautiful. You know, bite the lawn off at the margins. I'm not saying don't have a lawn, by the way. My little kiddo loves running around in our backyard on the lawn, but he also loves running amongst the, the plants and he loves seeing all the wildlife that's attracted to our yard. You know, so leave enough to play, but bite off at the margins where you can. 
here's some resources for you. And we'll have this for you with the post uh, National Wildlife Federation. You can put in your, uh, your zip code rather, and it'll pull up a list of plants that are serve as really good host plants, uh, native plants for uh, pollinators in your area. And the imapinvasives.org will help you identify some of these invasive plants and strategies for eliminating them. Then the next, uh, the next facet, moving on to our Bay Friendly Yards, uh, you know, in our Bay Friendly Yards program, the second uh, essential element is stormwater management. Um, so, unfortunately, stormwater is a big problem. We a lot of the runoff coming from our lawns and from our roads uh, take with it nitrogen, pesticides other kinds of roadway debris, metals, and so on, and just pollutants in general, and just run off into our, uh, into our receiving rivers and into the Great South Bay and, you know, points north of the LIE goes into the Sound. But the, the idea is the same all, wherever you are on Long Island and beyond, is that stormwater should be retained on site. The more we keep in our yards, the less that is running off and pulling contaminants into our waterways. It all makes its way to the Bay eventually. So there are a couple techniques for maintaining, retaining stormwater on your site. One of them is a bioswale. Uh, this is actually a project that we did. Uh, these rock, this rock is where uh, we are actually pulling the water off and this is a receiving channel. The receiving channel is there to, to dampen the erosive effect of the stormwater when it runs downhill. Actually, this homeowner had some terrible issues with uh, stormwater backing up into their garage. Uh, they had a, French drain installed and just a lot of the storm events would just overwhelm the capacity of the French drain. So we took advantage of nature. And the great thing about natural the stormwater infrastructure is that when you utilize native plants around your bioswale, you're actually increasing the capacity. So unlike, uh, unlike a lot of drainage infrastructure, which is at its most effective the first day that you install it, and then it loses its efficacy over time, these natural green infrastructure, such as bioswales, will only increase in their capacity over time as the plant roots develop and become more, and the soil becomes more porous. Here's a video, uh, this is actually on the south shore of Long Island. This, this bioswale pulls the stormwater right off the street and you can see the channel and the infiltration pit. The infiltration pit sounds complicated, but really it's just, uh, you know, we dig down three or four feet line it with a layer of pea gravel and then place the, the soil back. So you can see here, oh, storm mortar is routed from the street. The channel is lined with a ton of native plants. And then it pools over the infiltration pit. Frank, what is this right yard look like before? I'm sorry. What did this yard look like before you put this in? What happened with their stormwater? Oh, this the stormwater would just go down their driveway uh, and flood everything. It was just a quick driveway and a yard. So instead, we replaced it with an infiltration pit, as well as uh, this bioswale and about 80 native trees. Bear with me for a second. I'm just trying to get back to the presentation. Hit the one with the yellow. The yellow. Okay. How do we get back? Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. Here we are. So another another great technique is a rain barrel. This one's kind of simple. Again, we want to retain the stormwater on our land best we can. So there are a lot of things called rain barrels, which you usually attach to your, your gutter. And you what you'll do is you redirect the gutter instead of it going down into the outspout it goes into the barrel and just kind of sits there over time and then you can repurpose that rainwater by watering your plants with it and so in effect you're holding on to that storm water so that it doesn't add to the massive volume during any given storm there's no real defined terms or honestly there's no well-defined terms but anytime you have a garden it can be sort of a rain garden but really I like to think of rain gardens as you know, depressions where you plant rain or water loving plants so that the, the rain has somewhere to go and the plants kind of wick up the water. So this is just a simple rain garden. This homeowner, this is a project that a simple consultant 
simple simple consulting did whereas they, they used to have a lot of puddles and you could see the the paved area in the back it was just the storm water would pool so we installed this rain garden to wick up a lot of that moisture for the homeowner and it doubles on a, as a pollinator garden which is uh, really exciting and then local stewardship you know start where you stand every patch counts right uh so so what do we mean by stewardship well Maintenance refers, I think that has too much of a, a negative connotation where, where you're going in and you, you need this fluorescent green lawn and you need to mow every single week. Uh, in fact, it's, it's sort of a scam if you think about it. Uh, we mow every week and scalp the, the lawn. The lawn can, is always trying to regrow its above ground biomass and therefore it doesn't put a lot of uh, infrastructure below ground into its roots. It, it just can't because we're continuing to scalp it. So then the lawns become, uh, you know, go figure, stress. So then the landscape industry will sell you fertilizers and pesticides to facilitate, uh, you know, this fluorescent green lawn. So instead of that, stop mowing as much. Uh, don't, don't artificially in, uh, put in pesticides and fertilizers. It's, it's just not necessary and it's just destructive. You know, so that's this slide. So, so just stop. Uh, come to terms with the fact that a fluorescent green monocultural lawn is just not a healthy lawn. Who cares if there's clover or if some weeds that you mow or so on and so forth? You know, why are we trying to sterilize where we live? Let's, let's get rid of the fertilizers and pesticides. It's completely unnecessary. And like I said, mow less. Um, every two weeks is fine. I'll give you an excuse to be somewhat lazy in the summer. Let it grow up. Uh, the plant, the the lawn that you do re that does remain, will will thank you for it. You can use a mulching mower. There's a mulching blade, and it, by the time you mow the next batch, the, all the clippings will be reabsorbed into the lawn, providing a, a natural fertilizer for it. Leave the leaves. Uh, so again, another great excuse uh, to be lazy in the fall. Uh, you'll be surprised how many of these leaves just completely disappear by next spring. Uh, and, and this is where all of, or a lot of the native pollinators live. And this, will, this is what contributes to uh, this, what's called the uh, vertical accretion of soil, basically building the soil column. So these leaves become the soil, become the natural fertilizer, and I, I think are rather pretty. So leave the leaves in the fall. Don't do anything, just leave it where it lays. And watch those invasives. Uh, it's good to learn about the plants that you're dealing with. Um, pictured here is garlic mustard in bloom. Uh, it, it's a biannual plant. So it don't, you want to get, so if you have just a certain amount of time, get the things that are flowering, the, the plants that are flowering, so they don't go to seed, setting you back a year. Um, so, so watch the invasives and do a little bit at a time, but do it smartly. So by focusing first on the plants that are flowering, the flowering garlic mustard, you'll get it before it starts to explode into a huge issue. Thank you so much for joining us today, Frank. I had a couple of quick questions from the audience um, that I was hoping you could answer. Uh, one question was, how do you remove English ivy? Yeah, you remove English ivy. Well, first, if it's on the ground, you just yank it up. Uh, you can you can use a mattock or even if it's a huge area, you can use just a uh, like a mini excavator even or a, a skid steer. But if you're doing it by hand, you just yank it up and it comes out like a big uh, like you're tugging on a long rope and, and doing the most annoying game of tug of war ever, but don't yank it off the trees. Clip it at the base of the trees and you'll, you can watch it just kind of melt over time. You really don't want to yank because if, if you're going to tear the bark with it and it introduces uh, the, the opportunity for fungal pathogens. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And somebody had asked, what kind of berry bushes do you recommend that are native? Yeah, I really like high bush blueberry. That's a, that's a versatile one. Uh, it's it's actually it's shade tolerant, uh, but it it'll bury more in the uh, in the sun. Uh, not a berry so much, but a, a fruit. So I'll I'll go there. A beach plum is another favorite of mine. It the, it pops a beautiful white in the spring, and then it creates these little plums that you can pluck and turn into a nice jam. So those wow. are my two favorite recommendations. Thank you. And this is um, a nice segue. This last question is a nice segue into our. Um, pollinator packs and bulkhead bundles that Save the Great South Bay will begin um, uh, having on sale in our store coming up soon. But where can somebody buy native plants? Yeah, so there are a lot of great resources. Uh, 
online, there's, you can buy seeds and some plant material. Uh, give a shout out to Matt Gettinger over at Long Island Natives, who's a big supporter of the organization. He's a local native plant wholesaler. There are minimum orders. So if, if it's a small order that you desire, uh, we're working with Kim from KMS Native Plants. Uh, she's done a great job for us in, in helping to support our homeowners who want to just build a small little patch of uh, native plants in your yard. Mm -hmm. um, or you can buy one of our bundles that we're putting together. I wanted to say thank you very much. Again, this is Robin Silvestri, Executive Director at Save the Great South Bay. And a big thank you to Frank Piccinini, who is our Director of Habitat Restoration. I hope you can join us at our upcoming webinars on Saturday, March 13th. So Saturday, February 13th. Uh, when we will talk about how to create a butterfly garden. And again, Saturday, March 13th on how do you recycle stormwater. Thank you very much for joining us and we hope to see you soon.